welcome everybody to uh, uh, Literary Merit, the uh, second panel of our uh, second panel, our writing panel of our, our writing track, in which we are going to talk about surprise, surprise, literary merit. Literary merit. Sorry. So uh, um, the first question, of course, would be, you know, what is literary merit? But I think before we talk about that, let's uh, go ahead and uh, introduce ourselves. Um, I am Verizon. I am going to be uh, nominally moderating this. Uh, I am, as well as a fan fiction author and Everfree staffer. Uh, I also uh, work with the Royal Canterlot Library, which is a uh, fic review and uh, author interview uh, society that, that hosts weekly, uh, weekly interviews at royalcanterlotlibrary.net. So, I will have plenty to say about the topic of what makes uh, fan fiction good. Let's just go down the table. Uh, I'm Kai Kapai. I'm the head of the writing track for Everfree Northwest. I uh, have offered some fix, but I'm more famous uh, for writing in to Brunico and editing other people's fix. And uh, do you want this watch? Yep. Yeah. Well, we just got started. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry about that. Uh, I also uh, host a uh, YouTube site uh, where we do some videos on writing because sometimes people like to listen as much as uh, read. They just learn easier when someone's talking to them. So if you want to check out Larry Pike, she was fun. Yeah, the Richard Pike. Yeah. I'm Tony Jeff. He's also known as Gary Oak on fanfiction.net. What? What did you do, Pike? Oh, I didn't see you. Come on. Um, he was able to find the letter over there. Yeah, <laughs> literary merit. Yeah, I'm uh, yeah, I'm on literature five as well as CCAT over there. I'm a pre reader for the Royal Guard Group on Fin Fiction, if you've ever heard of them. Um, I've written a few stories. One's a pony novel that got me into fiction. Um, I'm a creative writing major at university. Uh, I wrote a story called The Sundering that I ended up submitting to college for a writing class. And uh, I also wrote a story about Scootaloo, which I ended up getting read by Scootaloo herself. Uh, I've written pony scripts for like television scripts, and I have one fiction award to my name, but nothing in the fan. So there you go. I'm Sukat Myla, and I wrote a thing. I, um, I've been on fan fiction for about two years, and I've written a few shipping type fictions. Uh, I really enjoy that. I've all, I'm also a member of um, the Literature Pie, as Gary mentioned. I've done a few videos on how to make yourself feel better when you don't get a lot of comments. I've done a few on how to know when it's ready to go, when you're ready to post. Things like that, because I want to make people happy and make things like that. Uh, I'm Dustwatch. I'm an editor on Fim Fiction. I'm not an author, so putting that one out there now. Um, but I have done pre reading for a number of other ponies on Fim Fiction uh, across a bunch of different stories, so uh, that's fine. Right. So, uh, this is about literary merit in fan fiction. I guess the first big question is, uh, can we talk about literary merit in fan fiction? We're, we're writing stories about brightly colored ponies. And, you know, uh, at, at some at, at some level, though, I mean, I don't think we would. I don't think any of us would be here if the answer were no. Uh, so, I mean, there is something which you know we can talk about uh, in, in terms of what elevates a story beyond just being words on the page. Um, anybody anybody want to sort of start taking some stabs at that? Well, I don't, I don't think the subject of the story really matters. What makes a good story is going to make a good story regardless of the, the particular genre we're writing in. So, uh, and again, not as an author, but just as an editor, it doesn't matter if we've got characters that are in a universe that we know nothing about or characters in a universe like My Little Pony that is very, very rich and well-developed. Um, if we can identify with the subject matter of the story, then it's still going to be a good story. So uh, I, I think it absolutely applies. You can make us care about them. <laughs> One point I want to make is anyone here familiar with the works of Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, is anyone here familiar with the Aeneid by Virgil? Which one? The Aeneid by Virgil. It's basically 
the Odyssey except from the Trojan stand, uh, point of view, and that's kind of how Rome was founded. But if you look at it in a certain way, it's kind of like fan fiction of Homer. It was, you know, it was written for, you know, a different set of people. Uh, yes. What's it called again? The Aeneid. How do you spell it? Uh, A-N-I-D. There you go, yeah. It follows Aeneas, and he was one of the uh, Trojans. And it starts with Troy aflame. So, fan fiction has existed in one form or another for a really long time, and I think a lot of people would consider the Aeneid a, having a lot of literary merit. So, yes, pony fan fiction can have it, as long as it's written well. Um, one of the big things that I think when you discuss this uh, fan fiction habit is um, what are you trying to write? Are you trying, trying to write a good story that just happens to be about ponies or are you trying to write a pony story and then make it good? If you go in with the perspective of you're trying to write a good story that happens to have ponies, I think you tend to have better stories in my opinion. Uh, Follow Equestria, I really like, I know some people have problems with it, but even the people who complain about it still admit that it's got a lot of what's there in a good story. And the point of that w was a story that happened to be about ponies. It wasn't like they set out specifically, I must find a pony story to write. Um, and I think the perspective when you go into writing literature matters a lot. If you're going in, when I started writing uh, fan fiction, I started writing um, to find out how my style would work. And pony fan fiction was a way of doing it. And that first fic was, it, it was fun, but it wasn't a great story. Um, and so a lot of people liked it, but you wouldn't call it like it. Would, you wouldn't say it has a lot of literary merit. Since then, um, one of my stories, T the Tiniest Troll, I set out. I had the story in mind that happened to be about ponies and a troll. It's called T the Tiniest Troll. Um, it actually has more reason in Russian than English um, because it, you know, just didn't get out there as much and it's not complete. Um, but a lot of people are saying, "Hey, this is like this author." And, like I've never heard about them, but they're you know some famous authors. It's like, oh yeah, it's a little bit like that. If you keep going, like you could really like be a, like a great author, I'm like, oh, this is really cool, because it's not just people saying they liked it, it's people saying that there was merit behind it. And so in my own works, I saw that um, as a huge difference between the quality of my writing. Queuing off that uh, uh, difference between uh, having pony stories uh, that you want to improve and having literature that happens to be about ponies, uh, one thing that uh, the author uh, Colden Gardiz, uh, you know, writes time after time is uh, stories about ponies are stories about people, uh, and I think when you start approaching stories from a literary standpoint, that becomes doubly true because you are looking at these things that you're reading as reflections on the human condition, and we are taking this very foreign world uh, of uh, brightly colored, you know, pastel magical ponies and using that to illuminate things that hit closer to home. Um, so, yeah, that's... No, that, that's, that's a good, just in gen the general sense, that's a good indication of why this fandom, I think, has gotten so popular. Um, in that we see uh, in, in the characters things that we know are good qualities that we should all have, Maybe, I mean, none of us are perfect, but maybe we see something in them that we think we should have, and so we kind of use them as the mirror to see what we need to have. Uh, and that's, that's what makes us connect with them on that emotional level that makes a good story. Uh, and so I, I know personally when I read stuff, I tend to favor longer stories with well-developed emotional, you know, well-developed characters that you can identify with uh, rather than the short one-offs that a lot of people write. Um, so. And I'm not saying there's anything bad with those, it's just, I, it's hard to write, in a 3,000 word story, to build a character that you can really, really identify with. Uh, you know, when they're happy, you're happy, when they're sad, they're, you're sad, so on and so forth. So. That's one of the reasons I don't have that many picks, is because I focus so much, and I try to make sure I focus that much on what the characters are feeling and what they're doing, and being able to um, show that. There's a better word for it, I'm sure. <laughs> Project. I think with literary merit, there just has to be something about that story that you can kind of take away from, and maybe it changes your views on something, it makes you think, because... More than just entertainment. Yeah, exactly, because some stories are just entertainment, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's, you know, it's a type of escapism, it's a lot of fun, it's a way we keep ourselves entertained. We as humans love stories, we're natural storytellers, but sometimes, you know, 
literary merit is it's just it's got something more to it. It's well, really hard to describe. And when you're when you're talking about strengths, um, a great example if you guys are, are here a little bit past the convention is the EMP is has a great thing right now on fantasy that where they talk about they have interviews from a bunch of different famous authors and one of the things that they talk about a lot is world building. Uh, there was a thing on world building and some people, it's all about the world building. Tol Tolkien, you read it for the world building, you don't necessarily read it because you actually uh, start off caring about the characters. It's They're very similar, they're not very expressive, it's, they're literally this exposition of what they're, they're feeling. They're not, you're not showing it, it's not show versus tell uh, for a lot of it at the beginning, you know, been trying to read it. And I don't like reading stuff like that, but I keep wanting to read it for the world. And I think Ponies has supplied a great world to build off of. And so the excellent work put in by Lord Fast at the beginning basically set a stage where everyone, whether they're from the show or not, when they're coming up and they're building on it, they're building on a very full and flush world and great characters. And so when you're writing, uh, if you see a good pony fic out there, they're playing off of you know characters or the the exposition or the wordplay. Wordplay is very um, common in a lot of you know maybe it's not the most common in the writing, but people will be notable noticed for having some really interesting wordplay um, in some of their fics every once in a while. And it's not even that, just building on the world in general, because you end up with stories like um, uh, um, Of Skies Long Forgotten, that it's all, the whole story is about the Pegasus Empire pre-Equestria, before the three tribes even meet. Um, and so they're using the lore from a world that's so rich, that isn't in the show ever. I mean, it's, it's touched on very briefly, but it's never really addressed. And But we can still build on that, because it's such a great world to build off of. And it, because of that, we can get stories that are worth taking our time uh, to sit down and read. And it's, I mean, they're 70,000 word stories, and we still sit down and read them. That's almost a tiny novel, so. Now, talking about that uh, uh, world building that the show has done right, I think actually um, is uh, almost a good place, a great place to start, because uh, when you're talking about literary merit, I mean, we can analyze the show in the same sort of way that we can analyze fan fiction. Uh, and one thing, I mean, even from the very first episode that caught me about My Little Pony uh, was the, uh, the arc you have with Luna and Celestia. Here you are introducing this show where you have this uh, being of light and this being of darkness. Uh, and you have this very traditional sort of, uh, I mean, almost Judeo-Christian sort of, uh, um, you know, God and the devil sort of mythology. And then from the very first minute or two of the show, they invert that. And the, the idea is that you have this sister who is banished and then redeemed. And that, is, that right there is something that you do not see in a lot of Western literature. Especially uh, kid. I mean, kids, you yeah. see, like, oh, we'll get a fight and we meet up, but you don't see, like, this this character portrayed as being bad actually being brought back to being good. Yeah. And I mean, some people would say, you know, that's what makes it a children's show, but here is something that we are presenting, uh, you know, well, that Hasbro is, uh, the Allure and Faust, is presenting as something that is worthy of moral note. And, you know, that, that is something that uh, you know, has a lot of impact. Are there other things in the show that you guys have, uh, you know, taken note of as, as being especially deep? Uh, the thing that actually got me into the show was, I'm like, eh, ponies, and I watched it because a friend was like, well, you should see this, and I'm like, well, you should see this other thing, I, it was like some anime, I don't even remember what it was, and so I started watching the ponies, I'm like, you know what? This isn't bad. That's the first thing that caught me about ponies. Is, you know, whether or not like all the animations, like, eh, it's okay. Like, I kind of like it. Okay, like the first song with Pinkie Pie. Like, you know what? There's some self humor in there. You know, I, I like that. And there weren't like a lot of things I didn't like. I mean, like the way the world was designed, the characters, the fact they all seemed to be a little bit different. I mean, it wasn't bad. And so I gave it a shot. And then that's when I got hooked. Was when I started watching it on my own in addition to, you know, the first two episodes, and then you just keep getting more and more into it. So, there's something to be said, not necessarily about grabbing the reader on the first page, but, you know, getting them completely enthralled, but, you know, getting it so that they read a little bit more, and then they read a little bit more. Well, if you've already, you know, read 5,000 pages, what's five, 10,000 more? If you've already watched an episode, what's, what, you know, watched two episodes, what's, you know, four or five more, and then, 
Uh, every once in a while you have an episode that I don't like, but I didn't see that until like season two, there was like one episode I didn't like. And then, um, no, actually I despise Less Than Zero. I, I, it bothers me so much. I'll hold it down. Thank you. Guys beat it. Thank you. It, and it made me so sad. And then, uh, but that's not the point. I mean, I can forgive that because so much of the rest of the, the stories are good that, you know, there's one, okay, so there's one story in season two, there's one story in season four that I don't like. Whatever. It's no reason to stop the show. I mean, if, if you had started with that, I wouldn't have liked it. So there's something to be said about a story that starts strong. And also, in strong, I would say is the most important thing of a story. Yeah, even if there's a, a couple of hiccups along the way, I mean, Darren Dunn, for example. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but the if a story ends at its highest point, it's best written. Your the readers will remember that, and they'll leave a really good impression. Anything else the show has done right? You guys have uh, appreciated. I would, have, I would have to say National Mystery Theater mm -hmm. because it was because even though it, even though it was very well paced, it was obviously building up to something, and that was probably kind of an hour one. Mm -hmm. I, well, I, I I would argue that the the best thing that it's done is again provide that mirror of stuff that we need to have as, as just good people to interact with other people, um, but. On the flip side of that coin, we've also got a bunch of other things that's done really well in, for example, building such a rich world without actually putting it out there and saying, this is the entire thing. We're sort of left bits and pieces, we're given bits and pieces, and we're sort of left to run, left to run with that as well. Um, and then they give us something like a map and we go crazy, and they're like, why hasn't this appeared in the show yet? Right. It's on the map. And, and there's, right. there's ways you can feel like that's actually there, like, you know, there's history we don't know about. I really like that. Yeah. It's a world it's lived in. Yeah, yeah you just feel the depth of the series. Um, yes, sweetie. Oh, uh, was, you, mentioned, you guys mentioned a couple times uh, that it, it would, the show would provide a mirror or good stories, good literature will um, give us something to take away uh, from it. Do you think that in order for something to have literary merit, that it needs to have Maybe this is the right way to phrase it, but it needs to have some sort of moral construction. Uh, do you think that for literature to be good, that that is a facet of it that it must have? And if it doesn't have that, then it's not good literature. Because um, I'm just, I'm just curious. Well, uh, I mean, I, I'd say it certainly helps, but uh, um, I, I don't think it's strictly necessary. Um, uh, but again, it, it definitely helps um, because there's. I, I've read a bunch of, and this is going back to honey fiction specifically, I've read a bunch of little tiny short, you know, one or two or three thousand word one-offs that have no real purpose. Uh, they're just good for a laugh, and, and that's fine. They're a good little distraction, but they're not the stories that really stick in my head uh, and, and really make me stop and think about stuff. So uh, it's not entirely necessary, but at the same time, it's the stories that that hit you in the gut, so to speak, that you really stick with you. Um, the ones that, you know, they'll, they'll make you cry, they'll make you laugh, that kind of stuff. So, um, because at the end of the day, we, we are emotionally driven creatures, so. And again, you don't have to, like, set out to do that, like, you know, from the start. Because sometimes that doesn't always work out. You can put too much in there, and it doesn't come out the way you want, but. Too obvious. Yeah. Well, I would say uh, that, um, a story with literary merit is one that teaches you something, and it's not necessarily going to be a moral lesson. Uh, for example, the most recent feature for the Royal Canterlot Library, which just went up this morning, uh, is a story named Run. And uh, the, uh, the main strength of that one, which, which got in its feature, uh, was the quality of the narration. Uh, the way that it used language, uh, President Perfect said in his, um, in his quote uh, in the review, for example, that it's like every word that it tosses is like a knife and just hits right on target. And so uh, something like that can teach us about you know, the way that language can be used to better effect. That's not necessarily going to come as a moral lesson. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Here. 
I actually read it through twice. Both times, multiple times each chapter, I'm smiling and crying at the same time. I, you get so emotionally invested in the character that, you know, I, I mean, I can find a moral in it, but honest, honestly, and I'll, the, honestly, it breaks my rule of the Indian, my personal rule of the Indian needs to be the best part of the fic to truly uh, make it a great fic. But it, it's really close, and the rest of the story, like the, where the climax is, and I won't ruin it for anyone, but um, it's very obvious what the meaning of the story is. I mean, it's a fairly straightforward meaning, like, be nice to people. Like, that's all the real story, like, read your story meaning you can get from it. But the investment you have in the characters, you're looking at everything, every single word you get invested in, and you want there to be more. Even when the story ends, you recognize it as being a nice, solid ending, and you still want just more to have been in the thing. But you know that if it, there was more, it would ruin it. Like, we're, we're, when the reader's torn, that's, that's when you know you have a really, really good thing. Yeah, Up, Up Sky's Long Forgotten is a, is a good example of that, too, in that, uh, <laughs> it, uh, I, it, it, I am not 24, I'm a little liar, I just edited it. <laughs> um, um, but it's, it's a good story, and especially for someone, I guess maybe I've got a, a bit different perspective on having been in the military and been in combat, but there's parts of that story where it's like, I actually found it difficult to, to read because of personal experiences I've had in my life and, and some of the things that I've seen. But at the same time, you can't stop. It's it's that well developed that you get sucked into it, and you literally can't put it down. Or at least I can. Um, even though it's like I'm reading it through tears, going, I can identify with this on a very personal level. Um, but at the same time, I can't. St I I want to walk away from it, but I can't. So uh, there, you you run into that as well when you when you write a good story. So. I mean, all my fault. I mean, uh, I mean, this completely strange changeling has uh, um, uh, had to stand up for a while. Uh, so I'm a literary studies major, uh -huh. and I'm breaking into fan fiction. I wrote, I've written short stories before, though. Uh, this sounds a lot like literary, uh, literary fiction versus pop fiction or commercial fiction. Uh, and as I'm trying to decide how I want my focus on my story to be, should I focus take it more to the literary side, being that I do have some, or you do have some creative. Uh, Target audience. Who are Target you audience, yeah. I mean, if, if you're writing it for, for people like us who way overthink things, <laughs> go more towards the in-depth literary stuff. If you, if you want to write a short story, it's maybe a, a, a comedy um, or to test your waters in the point of fan fiction. I mean, comedy, honestly, random comedy, like if you're new to fan fiction and you just, like, I'm not going to be very good, but I want to get something out there, I want it to be fun, random comedy is great for that. But what you're, what you're trying to do is different based on your you have to analyze what does your story want to be because sometimes you want you sit down and write a story like this is going to be a novel but it ends up being a short story or even a film or something you don't know what it's supposed to be so you have to kind of let it grow and sometimes stories will say hey i am a piece of literary fiction please write me as literary fiction and if you're sensitive to that then you can form it as such just have an idea and cultivate it and see what it becomes so That's what kind of dinosaur you're making <laughs> I'm actually going to dissent a little bit here because uh, I think that literary merit is something that is independent from popularity. Uh, that you can write a story that is good and it also becomes popular. Uh, it's a little bit harder because you're juggling two balls instead of just one. Um, but uh, you, I mean, the, the fact that you are building layers in does not stop you from telling a story that will you know hook people in and we're we'll have other panels like uh, making the big time for example we'll talk about what makes a story popular that was uh, you know very popular one last year and we're looking forward to doing it again sometimes you just get unlucky and even if you have an objectively fantastic story it has like 50 views <laughs> it, just, it just happens and sometimes there's a bad story that gets like a bazillion and sometimes there's a really good yeah, story there's a reason, that has a there's a reason why you oftentimes see authors saying i have no idea what happened like i wrote this in like an after i spent a a month on that thing, no one read it and, and no one liked it. And it's been an hour on this one and everyone loved it. And it yeah. What's popular is a lot harder to determine than what is good actually. Well, I'm also a big advocate of just write what you want to read. I've actually noticed I know that's that a lot of the best stories that get popular remain so 
because the author just ignores the fact that it's popular. A, a, not a great example, but a decent example of this is Paradise by Slywood. It that's been up for like two, three years now. She started writing on DeviantArt and it blew up when she got on fan fiction, but she hasn't really changed anything. What do you think, Sandra? Well, DeviantArt is unfortunately not a place to really find and follow no. fan fiction, unless you're finding a fan fiction of an artist that you follow. Yeah, but I mean, in some sense, if you're giving the audience explicitly what they want, you're not writing the way that you're invested in it. And I think that kind of takes you out of the story as, as author a little bit. Yeah, the, yeah that, that's where I tested my what I was trying to say. Yeah. Well, here's one example. Do you know how many times the creators of Ponies just sort of like looked at fan requests and just kind of laughed and just sort of did their own thing anyway? And look at yeah. the, look at, I mean, we just had Dragon Ball Z at the end of season four. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and it's awesome. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think so they, should, they should do, they should do that. They should listen to us and then take what ideas we give them and kind of incorporate it in the shop. If we do. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, for an example of when they shouldn't. I, I think that fan <laughs> actually does a better job of the show than the show does in a lot of respects. You have to filter through to find the really good parts, but I mean, if we have 100,000 or, what is it, 65,000 stories on fan fiction now, some of them are going to be better than the show. They just are just by statistics. Yeah, well, and there, there's an aspect of that too, in that in writing a story, you can make it much, much longer then you can cram into a 22 minute cartoon. Mm -hmm. uh, and so yeah, each sure. author that's writing can do a 200,000 word story that is just as entertaining as that 22 minute episode, but it's much, much grander in scope and much more detailed, so. Yeah, we're also not writing for five year olds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, as someone who's actually written spec scripts for My Little Pony, like I've actually had to write the 22 minute episodes to the structure, to the, like, by the numbers, and it is actually a very difficult thing to do, and it's night and day between the stories, and uh, I actually wrote a Scootaloo episode where she gets feather flu and ends up uh, failing really hard at a, at a uh, competition, and like a ball kicking competition, and um, the, the thing is, is, the episode where um, the flag waving one, you remember that that flag waving on the Skulu and like her difficulty flying and all that sort of came into play. That came out like a few uh, weeks after, and my friend just said, "I like your your version better." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's actually a really hard thing to like screenwriting is just <laughs> difficult. Trust me. Have you heard the story of uh, when Pixar was first pitching Toy Story, mm -hmm. and they originally wrote it? They got all these notes from Disney that was just like you know make it edgier, make it more adult, and oh, stuff yeah. like that. And they took all the notes and they put them in because they figured, well, these guys know what they're talking about. Ruined the movie. It sure did. <laughs> they showed the, the preview and the Disney people hated it. And they were like, what were these people doing? And they're like, they were listening to your notes. Um, so it's take the notes, but take what you can take from it, but don't just go straight up. And well, and, and the, really nice. the flip side to that is, Take the notes, and, but also at the same time, don't be afraid to do what you know is right. Um, because in that example, what ended up happening, what most people don't know is what ended up happening is after they did all of that, uh, when they went back, Steve Jobs actually had to go back to Disney and said, look, either you're gonna let us do this because that's what you hired us to do, or we're walking away from it and you can have this piece of garbage. And Disney went, all right, you clearly know what you were doing when we hired you, so we're just gonna let you have free reign. And we ended up with the movie Toy Story, so, uh, that, that we know and love today. That so. we also know is walking there, There's the phrase, too many hands in the kitchen, too. I mean, you can have as many great people as you want working on something, and the more you add, the harder it is to keep everything together, because you'll just have a, maybe a comma, maybe a word here, where there, it slowly will start to uh, dissolve and unravel. Um, the, the way humans work is we're usually like we operate really well in groups of like two to at most 15. Now obviously when you're doing something like fan fiction, the, if you have 15 people writing it, it's not going to work. <laughs> but we have like a big project like, like Toy Story. Well, I mean there's a reason why a lot of TV shows will only have like 
one or two writers for you know sitcoms and stuff like that. It keeps it consistent. You know, it keeps it evolving along the same line because we've had plenty of episodes where they bring in new new people and it feels like it's stepped back. But then their next episode, you know, is it feels more up to speed and it's just getting used to the process that they go through on the show, getting used to writing the different characters, uh, seeing how the episode turns out. Because once you write it, you don't have any input. I mean. And meanwhile, back to fan fiction, though, I think uh, I thought he was wanting to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. along the lines of uh, people giving feedback, I've, I've heard some author, I don't know exactly who, said, uh, when, some, when someone tells you something is wrong with your writing, they're usually right. When they tell you how to fix it, they're usually wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Um, one of my, my screenwriting professor said that 90% of what you hear in a workshop is crap. <laughs> Just completely useless. Is this a workshop? Uh, <laughs> no, a workshop is when we just you, finish one of those. Yeah, <laughs> it's when you discuss a story and then you like you go around uh, do like a round table things. Like, this that, is what I like. This is what did. That ninety percent statistic was part of the ninety percent rapid raving around that for a little while. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we, we did promise in the uh, in the con book uh, that we would uh, discuss and dissect some of the fandom's greatest works uh, and learn how to apply those lessons to our own writing. So uh, I think we can actually sort of pivot from here and uh, um, actually start trying to talk a little bit more uh, c concretely about uh, the literary merit. Um, I, I was going to suggest that we start uh, with a story that pretty much everybody has read. Uh, let's just show hands around the room. Who has read My Little Dashie? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Well, that's what I thought. Oh, okay. Yeah, keep, keep those hands up. Um, how many people here uh, think My Little Dashie was a good story? <laughs> Who's it about that? How many people think My Little Dashie has some literary merit as we would discuss it? I'm seeing, okay, I, I'm seeing hands. Uh, there are some brave people out there in the audience. Very good. Okay. Uh, but, uh, so, Take names. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so here's the thing, though, is that, is that we can learn from stories that, uh, I mean, this is still a story that can teach us lessons because My Little Dashie is popular. It is far and away the most read thing, like by a factor of 10, out of any story on fanfiction.net and any story in the fandom. Uh, and so I think this is, you know, an example here that what makes a story popular is not necessarily what makes it good. We've had a lot of people, you know, in this room who have read it and, you know, did not care for it. Um, and, and so uh, what is it that My Little Dashi, let me, let me throw this out to my fellow panelists, what is it that My Little Dashi is doing right? that has gotten at that attention because, you know, clearly clearly people are picking for some reason. Feels. Yes, she feels. feels. Yep. <laughs> it, it's she a great intro fic into fan fiction, especially for this particular genre, and it was the first to do what it did. Yeah, it got there first. Uh, but if you want literary merit, just take what My Little Dashie did and do the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like what my uh, professor did. So wait a second, are you saying she leaves the point of land to go live with a strange human in a box? No, it's a strange so, human they find in a box. box. <laughs> <laughs> it's like what my prof did. Like, for the first, for a first year script writing class, he actually sat his entire class down and made them watch Tommy Wiseau's The Room. <laughs> 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 seen enough things about it that I'm like, yeah, I have no interest in reading it. Uh, and so there's there's that aspect of it too, is that it's very popular, but at the same time, it's, it's so many people have read it and commented on it that I'm like, I don't even have any desire to read it. Uh, there was another, um, there was another, um, I, I was walking, have you, have you guys ever heard of the uh, nostalgia, right? Have you heard of the nostalgia? Yes. 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 Does right is that it evokes an emotional response in the people yeah. reading it, 
And I think what it does wrong is that the only people that could possibly get an emotional response out of it is the brony fandom, the people that it's popular yep. with. It, it's not at all universal. It, it's just that we happen to be the type of people that, in, as a big group, that might identify with. Yeah, yeah, and that's a perfect pivot. Is you know, uh, my little dashi gets the feels right for a lot of its readers, not all of its readers. What can we learn from that? Uh, you know, about how can we write feels in a way that is makes a story great. Things that are the different and things that are the same are two things the human brain really responds to. Yeah, when you see sad fix, you know, even if it's not ponies, but where someone has a loved one and they lose it, you will be your brain will be trained will slowly train itself to as it sees this, it'll start invoking the emotions that you had in the previous story and the previous story. And that's how you get romances and uh, sad stories that you know build like people who read this book now read this book and they're completely different authors and it, it's even more feels but you know that one's always my favorite and then when you do something slightly different like Dashi did where he, where the main character found Dash then it changed it up a little bit it's also new and interesting so now you have the same old feels that your brain is conditioned to but it's new and interesting so you pay more attention. And you see a lot of things that are end up being both popular and have literary merit have those traits. And I don't really remember who said it, but someone was talking about how even with some stories that you don't necessarily connect with as much, you could still find yourself having a response because even though it may not be the character you're sad about, you're thinking about someone who reminds you of that character. Like, that's, it's not that dog that died you're sad. You're sad because your dog died. Well, um, one of the one of the definitions I've heard of what is literature is something that is still worth talking about in a hundred years' time. Obviously, none of us have the time to wait that long. <laughs> what we've read. Yeah. So I think the best example of this, and actually it's really applicable to uh, the genre of fan fiction, is H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. Mm -hmm. At the time, H.P. Lovecraft was writing. Um, it was schlock. It was it was a dime store. It's essentially the literary equivalent of like a book you pick up at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And uh, but there there are college classes now completely dedicated to his works. And a more miserable man you could not have found. <laughs> but uh, but I think I think that that sort of but it has those themes in it. That, that, that sort of attachment to a very primal fear of something we can't know and can't possibly combat in any way, either intellectually or, or physically. Yeah. And so because it has those uni that universal theme of basic primal fear, um, as opposed to in the context of uh, ponies, you know, the sort of that, that friendship and unity is possibly the most valuable asset we can possess. But it, 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 it taps into that universal thing, and it's something that can echo through time. And uh, in that vein, I think, uh, starting back to my little Dashi, uh, the universal button that Dashi is hitting is love and loss. And it doesn't hit that for everybody because of the particular situation of the story, but uh, um, you have here a guy who is getting close to a friend, and then at the end she goes away, and half of your audience bursts into tears. Well, and, and the flip side of that point, and, and to kind of, I guess, restate it in a little bit different way, is there's, like I said, we're all emotional creatures, and so what what gets us is emotion, and there's only two things in the world that will really motivate anybody to do anything, uh, and those two emotions are fear and hope, and so. In all of those stories where we see great literary merit, be they pony or not, um, we have to see ideally both of those extremes because one is useless without the other, but we have to see at least one of those two extremes uh, at some level. So in the case of like Michael Dashi, there's not just loss, but there's also fear of, I, I would argue, fear of being alone or uh, fear of the unknown, what comes after this. But at the same time, there's also hope uh, in that will Dash actually choose to stay or so there's that aspect of it too at the end of the story. She's, she's uh, getting her proper life back. Right. There's, there's that sort of And moment. so you, you, you hope that she'll do better in you know where she's supposed to be, but at the same time you fear what's gonna come after that. And so we, we see that dichotomy of both of those emotions driving people. Uh, well, and I think that applies again, not that's great literary stuff regardless of whether it's funny or not. So 
Well, and with Ben Ladash, you also have at the very end the main character's like, he's sad, you know, he's basically mourning the loss of his child for all intents and purposes. Um, but at the same time, you know, he pauses the thing, you know, he sees the pictures that were left that Celestia allowed to stay of him and Dash. And then he remembers all the good times. So now you have this, it, it's love, it's lost, but it's also these great memories that you've read about and that even ones that are in addition and it makes you think. And then he's like, you know what? My life has been around her for the past X many years, but I can go out and I can, I can have just as close of a relationship with anyone else. And so it's not just, you know, hope that things will be better. It's a very specific hope playing on a very specific fear, not just fear and hope in general. And I, uh, Tired was name dropped earlier. I think Tired does write the same, a lot of the same things that my little Dashie did write without all of the things it did wrong. So, uh, that, 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 would, that would be the one I would recommend in its place where you're, you're dealing yes. with Pinky uh, having that, those sensations of loss uh, and you know looking back nostalgia in, in the same sort of way. Yeah, the story that it's it has the two high points. It's got the climax and then the falling action, but it has a really solid ending too. And those are the two punches in the gut. You'll know them when you see them. I, I won't spoil it though. It's only about seven thousand words, so it'll take you I don't know half an hour to read. Yes, you should all read it. <laughs> <laughs> are you you all? Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm I'm one of the guys who pre-read it for Tear Team. Yes. I go to work on yeah that they grew up. What was the name? Tired. Tired by. Having me? Evan May. Evan May? Yes. Tired by Evan May coming soon. All the seals. Any other uh, any other thoughts, uh, guys, on the uh, my little dashy, the the feels, etc. Uh, no, I think that particular. I think we covered it pretty good. Yeah, it's been. Right. <laughs> uh, of course. Okay. Well. Um, I can I can switch uh, topics over to uh, I, I previously mentioned Skyrider's Princess Celestia Hates Tea, which is an extremely uh, different uh, you know example of literary merit because uh, uh, Princess Celestia Hates Tea uh, just quick show of hands who has read it before uh, more people than I expected very good um, it's a comedy in which uh, we discover that Princess Celestia for the past uh, <coughs> millennium and more has been faking her love for tea, and uh, the truth comes out. Uh, so um, here we have something that is uh, going for laughs. It, it is a comedy. It is not a tragedy. It, it is not you know, evoking the feels. It is evoking the funny bone. Uh, and yet, I think there's a lot of literary merit into it, because uh, um, you take this silly premise, uh, and then all of a sudden, halfway through, it stops and almost deconstructs it. You look at this idea that um, she has been lying to her subjects for a thousand years, uh, and that falls apart, and all of a sudden, we see the damage that the truth is doing, um, and that leads to some very big questions about, you know, what does responsibility mean? You know, the what destruction of an entire socioeconomic structure, yeah, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and it, and it comes from something that we've all had to deal with, and that's social expectations. I mean, we're, we've all had our family, you know, been with our family at a time where we're like, well, I'm supposed to be here with my family, but, you know, Uncle Benji, he's, you know, not having a good day, and he knows he might be, you know, having a little drink, or he might be a little bit more uh, raucous or something, and it's just making something, you know, not enjoyable than it's supposed to be, but... You know, if you're the good niece, nephew, wife, husband, daughter, grandparent, whatever, you stay there, like, yeah, Uncle Benji, yep, yep, heard that story before, yeah, no, 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 don't, don't touch the dog. Uh, it, 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 it's the kind of thing that we've all had to deal with, but we don't ever talk about, really, in a, in a larger sense. Plus, at one point, she knights a fern, and that's, you know, pretty funny. But yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I can make something up. <laughs> uh, well, are there other stories that uh, um, illuminate that sort of thing? You've seen? Well, I don't really read many comedies. Um. Any suggestions from the audience? Uh, are there good stories to write? I see one in the back. Um, so, how many of you have heard of George Bernstein's version? Who's that? 
Uh, it ranks a lot. It has an <laughs> alter, he also has an alter ego uh, called Imploding Colon. Publishes a new chapter every day, you guys can say. Yes. Uh, that's called an Australia series. And what I like about it is it's like a character I kind of grew up in about Rainbow Dash. Because she can be a jerk in the show. She's got better baby, but she can be a jerk. And over the course of an epic world spanning adventure, it does so much with her character development. And her development as a character is one of the things that ties together so many different story arcs. It's how she's dealing with it. So there's a story I would recommend for both literary and popular. Has anyone read The White Room? Yes. yes. I think so. Yeah. Is it the one where you have to like highlight, like control A to highlight the text to read it? Uh, <coughs> yeah, that's that's that might be White Box. Oh, White Box. Yeah, that's, that's, what I was <laughs> oh, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Tell us about White Room. Okay. I think it might be called White Box. I think it's White Box. Um, There's the Empty Room. There might be, that might be it. Okay. Because I know it's basically about this. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. Is it a Google yeah. Doc with a black background? Does it have That's a canvas? <laughs> um, yeah. That's White Box. Okay, that's okay box. It's, so it was the It was White Box. Box. Okay, well, that's an interesting experience. Yeah, you actually highlight the text. It. I really, yeah. I loved it too. And I'm like, because the thing is, I really like those sort of, and those kind of psychological exploration pieces of like, a, a, here's a show about magic and friendship. Well, what happens when a guy is in a world full of magic and friendship, but he's not getting that? And like when he's trapped in his place because of who he is, what everyone else is supposed to be accepted. Yes. And then that dichotomy, that's interesting. Isn't there that a second person? person? I like that one so huh? much. Isn't it a second person? I don't think White Box is, but. Oh, okay. no, it's, it's first. Yeah, oh, it's you, first person. First. Oh, right. He has to keep yeah, checking yeah. his name. Okay, right, right. Yeah. He counts the steps. And I like that story so much that I, uh, go ahead. Oh, that, well, that simplicity. Yeah. I like, it's, it's very kind of dry when you read it, but there's so much more in between the lines. It's like, and then I count the steps, and then I go to the wall. And then you can tell from that what kind of, what kind of, like, damage maybe is the right word, that that environment is done to him without even having to say, oh, it was sad, I was trapped in a yeah. box. It, you know, I've been oh, reading that has I, uh, more meaning to it. Is yeah. it? My former place I used to work, our um, our break room was getting painted. At first, it white, yeah. so it was all white. And so one day, I just kind of took a pencil and I go, "Yes." <laughs> <laughs> they painted over it. That's no one else nodded at me. <laughs> I had a, another one, but I'm trying to find it real quick so I can remember the title. So okay, okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, How many of you guys have ever read a uh, the story there ever called the Cantaloupe called the Young the Cantaloupe Healing Process? One more time. How many of you I, how many of you guys have read, read a story called the Cantaloupe Healing Process? The Cantaloupe Healing Process. Nobody. Oh, oh no. It's basically a, it was a, it's a continuation of a Cantaloupe when and it deals with you know and and I. So you may remember I brought this up uh, last year, but um, it's about, you know, Shining Armor, Celestian, and Twilight's friends trying to figure out how they're going to approach Twilight and apologize to her for what they did for her. Oh, yeah. So, I, I remember you talking about that, yeah. Yes, that's not I brought that up last year, so it was kind of, you know, like, like what I did was I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, how I wanted to write, you know, how is Shining Armor going to approach Twilight and all that sort of stuff, so. And I think that's one very important uh, function that uh, a fan fiction can have, is when the source material stumbles, uh, you know, we get the opportunity to fix it and address things in ways that, uh, um, you know, that, that, that make more sense, that, uh, you know, touch on deeper things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, before we continue questions, we did start about five minutes late, but it is uh, five fifteen. So coming up on it. Yeah. So, yeah, so five minutes of OT. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll take a couple of questions, and then I think we should probably just start. Sure. Yeah, we want to make people run fast. Okay. Right. Uh, we haven't heard from you yet. Um, one of the ones that I like is uh, it's called the writing on the wall. 
Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. oh my editor wrote that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, by, by horse voice, yeah. The, the reason I really like is, A, it, it, it's, um, it's sort of a mystery that you have to solve as you're reading it. Um, but B, it reminds me of a short story that I actually read in high school called By the Water in Babylon, um, which is about, you know, the sort of, um, you have to kind of piece together in, in your head as you're reading the story, what is going on, where is this person, what time frame is it, and, and it's, it, it has a twist at the end that I don't want to give away, but it, it's a very powerful twist in both cases, and I really enjoyed that turn. I remember reading that as well. Yeah, I wish I had the sort of school that assigned a hunting gun fiction. Quick note, that, that story I was looking for called Dreamflow, and it's a, another interesting example of literary merit. And it's it's a, such a different style of writing. The entire thing is dialogue between two characters, oh, wow. particularly, uh, I believe, Applejack and, and uh, Pinkie Pie. It could be, I, I'd have to go back and reread it again. It's been a while. Uh, but none of it is exposition. It's all actual dialogue. And so in that, in that same sense, it gives you a lot of time to really think and go, why are they saying what they're saying? And why, why, why are they saying it in the way that they're saying it? And that kind of thing. So there's literary merit in those kinds of stories as well, and where they're just different, and they really kind of make you stop and think and go, how else can I approach certain things that I do? So uh, before we do another question, I just want to say there's only one mantra that is 100% true in writing, and that says, if it works, it works. Yeah. So, for example, that story, that premise sounds like it, there's no way it could possibly be good, <laughs> but if it worked, but it worked. <laughs> so I'm not sure yeah. I would necessarily call it a good story in that it's, a, I, I prefer court but stories worry. with emotionally gripping characters that I can identify with. Uh, but at the same time, I enjoyed reading it because it's just so different, and I'm like, it took me, it took me a couple chapters to get used to before I, I really kind of actually started to follow it and realize what was going on. Uh, but when I finally figured out what was going on, it, it turned into a story that I could actually go, wow, I don't necessarily like the style in which it's written, but I like the premise of the story, and I don't want to spoil it for anybody, so I'll, I'll leave it. Just remember that mantra, though. So sometimes if you do have to break a cardinal rule, if it's best for the story from an artistic perspective and you are good enough to break it, by all means, break it and see if it works. Yes, I'm learning that. Maybe know the rules I want to mention how uh, hard we get in people to the context, because if you have basically an adventure story, and then I just want to ask you questions, ask you questions about what is morality. What does it mean when you actually have the consequences of what are you allowed to do in that case? Those kinds of questions, you know, you take basically what should be a adventure story premise and say, I'm going to actually explore something a little bit more deep, deep, deeper than that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really cool thing to do. A, a shorter uh, a sure exploration of the same concept is a story called Invo Dash, wherein uh, Rainbow Dash is actually granted complete immunity from any of her actions for one day. Basically, nobody will remember that she existed that day. Uh, so she can get away with anything that she wants. And she realizes at the end of the story that some of the things she's just like, that wasn't really a good idea. Uh, and she might get away with it scot-free, but she still has to, she will still remember that day, and she still has to live with those consequences. So uh, a similar kind of concept, yeah, where you, you have to wonder if there were no consequences, do we still do what we do? Uh, and it's tackling the questions like that that oh, drives that one? the literary. Uh, Bo that's Dash. Idbo Dash, I believe, was the title of it. And I don't remember who it's by, I'm sorry. Uh, I D B O W dash. Two oh, words. In. I get yeah, it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then it and you go. One more strong example for literary merit that I was actually introduced to through the Candle Candlelight Library was uh, the Arbitrage of Moments, which actually has a really nice infectious mood. Uh, even if it's a bit unpleasant. Uh, but it also makes you think about what is valuable about life and friendships, and it's just a, a good one to think about. Yeah, it's, uh, um, it, it, if you haven't read it, it's about a, uh, um, an OC basically, uh, I think I can say this without too much spoilers, uh, taking over uh, Twilight Sparkle's body, um, and then examining the fallout of that after he was caught. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, any last minute uh, questions, concerns? All right, well, thank you for uh, joining us for Literary Merit. We will uh, still be here to take some questions afterward and uh, um, otherwise. Pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Swag. Okay, so, all right, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Yay,